Uh, I don't think you can talk to a person in my family, whether they're longshore or not, that they wouldn't talk about longshoring. It's just such a big part of our family, man. It, I just think it's part of our blood from both sides, the Cornejo and the Ibarra, because there's longshore blood in both sides. I grew up in, in a small village here on uh, the waterfront. It was called Front Street. And our little village uh, included about 20 families, Mexican families, all Mexican families. And uh, we called it Mexican Hollywood because it's just us Mexican. And we heard of Hollywood, the other Hollywood. And so we, why can't we have a Hollywood? So we called it Mexican Hollywood. Mexican Hollywood was from the Iowa, the Iowa battleship is from there to where the Vincent Thomas is, and Front Street was as far as it went, so that was right there. It was uh, uh, low-income families, you know, very low-income families, and we were just barely surviving, you know. So if anybody ran out of food, we just holler across the street, hey, comadre, do you have any uh, beans today? Do you have any bread, eggs, potatoes? We would share. Sure, sure, come on over. So I would run across the street and share and get the food for my mom, and then we would have a meal. And then we had our little beach. Uh, excuse my French, it was called Bear Ass Beach because we used to go skinny dippy. We would make sure that none of the boys were around or, you know, the little kids, uh, us girls. And uh, we had a wonderful time there. I had to be about five years old. I remember uh, going when the red car came over. The red car was still coming over and uh, they throw money at BAB, the Bear Ass Beach, and, and we dive in for the money. I remember my dad telling me for fun, they would swim across the channel, back and forth. At that time, the channel was probably a little smaller than it is today, but yeah, that's what they did for fun. Poppy and Olivia's father, Val Cornejo, entered longshoring full-time after he served in the military during World War II. Nicknamed Rabbit, he was the first member of the Cornejo family to join the ILWU. Although they grew up poor in the Mexican Hollywood neighborhood of San Pedro, the Cornejo family's life improved after Rabbit joined the LWU. It changed for, for all of us as a family because we, we didn't ask. I mean, we had everything, you know, with the income that he was bringing in. I mean, he used to uh, open accounts for me to get my clothes, you know, at Lewis's here, department store, Hartfield's was, when it was here. Go ahead, Miha, my daughter. That means my daughter. Open an account, you know, get what you want. So that's what I always had nice clothes. Uh, my dad was the kind of person, <laughs> you know, if the latest TV came out, he had to have it. And he would get it, and everybody would come to my house. Oh. But he had marbles, I had marbles. And baseball gloves, I had baseball gloves. I just seemed to have everything. But what he th taught me was to share. We always shared with everything. He had the new first new satellite with the big giant satellite. I came home one day, and it was cut off. Dad, what happened? He said, oh, so-and-so needed it. Oh, so I learned that. And as far as the work ethic, too, what I learned growing up from my dad is uh, every spring, we had a big backyard full of weeds, taller than I was. He'd make me cut them down and sweep it. And there was an old, old saying, you know, kind of a joke when my dad made foreman that he swept his way into the foreman unit because he'd go to, down the hatch and First thing he would do, he'd make sure everything was clean. So when I got down there and they hear Cornejo, well, I had to, you know, I had to keep up the good rep. So I, I could not be, you know, I'd make my dad proud and my relatives that also worked down there and friends. So, yeah, and because uh, word got around real quick. You know, because the name is pretty much everything which you have on the waterfront. You know, I mean, your work ethic, it's everything. It's everything. Because that's the last thing you want to do is tarnish anybody's good name or all their hard work by not doing the right thing. Down at the port, and in general, I was taught from the get-go, you, you're, you're only known for your, for your work ethic and how you treat people. I, I've learned that since my grandfather told me from the get-go. Old school, and I love it. I love people down there old school. They say, go down there, shut up, do your job, go home. We have a saying on the waterfront, it takes about five minutes to get a jacket, and it'll take the rest of your career to get it off. In other words, if you show up late, if you've got an attitude, if you're somebody that's, that's always pushing back authority, you know, you get labeled. 
you know, that, that's what I got from John and his family and his, and his uncles and his aunts, that, uh, you know, just do your job, keep your nose clean, and, you know, just give the, the employer an honest day's work and they'll give you an honest day's pay for it. Well, when I got in, we didn't know anything. So I used to go to the job with six pairs of gloves in my pocket because I didn't know which ones you used for that particular job. And I didn't want to look like an idiot because when I got in, my brothers would tell me, don't ever earn a jacket down there because if you earn a jacket, you'll never be able to take it off. The modern goods movement industry includes numerous female dock workers. However, when Rose Ibarra entered the ILW in 1985, she was among a pioneering generation of women who worked on the docks. When I first got in, it wasn't nice. No one ever wanted to partner up with you. And even though I, I pumped and I worked hard, no matter what, they would say no. So I started figuring, out, figuring it out that, you know, I'm tired of being stepped on. You know, I hold my own, so I'm not asking no more. So I would go to the job, and the boss would say, well, who's your partner? I go, whoever gets stuck with me. Ain't that what you're thinking right off the bat? I'm the only girl on the job. I mean, she's a tough lady. And she, I don't remember her ever coming home and complaining about that because she's not going to take that kind of crap. And a lot of people that I meet now and they know her, they'll, they'll say, your aunt didn't take any crap. You know, the guys had to hold their head above water and they didn't want the women down there. Some guys told me, hey, Rose, listen, some guys are mean like that or bosses because their sons didn't get in. So you have to take it like a grain of salt. So I always, even if I cried, after I got a, <laughs> 10 blocks away from the job, I would cry like a baby. But at that time, I would have to act tough. Growing up poor with nine siblings, including six older brothers, earned Rose a grit that she carried with her the rest of her life. We grew up from the projects, you know, from being all 10 of us together to all the way up. My mom always made it that if you have one piece of bread, all 10 of you get a piece. You got food, you don't take it out unless there's enough for everybody. If that means you're, you stay hungry till everybody leaves to eat that one little piece of bread, you do it. I remember working as a, uh... As young as nine years old, I used to work in a in a in a barber shop, shining shoes, for a quarter. You know, anything to help the family. He was poor. He he was he was born in Aguascalientes, and out of ten, he was the oldest of the boys, and uh, he would have to shine shoes to help his mom, you know, make a bring money in, because he was the oldest. He'd do anything, you know, so that that's he struggled from from a little guy all the way up to being a longshoreman. You know, my dad taught us work ethics. He was a man that could, I think, do everything, everything. And being that we didn't have any money, we did everything. We repaired cars, and he, and he always taught us to do the best we could do. You gotta do a good job. Yeah, it doesn't matter how long it's gonna take you. If you have to take that thing apart 39 times, you just gotta come out right. And uh, that was one of the things that I, I really learned. And that's what I, I, I think I taught my kids too. My dad taught me how to cut the grass. You know how you edge a grass? With an ax. Dude, imagine a, a kid in second, third grade using an ax to edge the grass. I remember it like it was yesterday. And, and I didn't grow up with my dad uh, coming to my events at school and all, because he was working. We weren't poor like, uh, homeless people just didn't have it. And my dad was always looking for a better job. That's what drives him his work. And then when he got in the union, to me, it was one of the greatest days of my life. I, I think we felt very, very secure when I got that job. Up until then, for example, we had we had no, no large savings, savings for a house, savings for, you know, buying a, buy a useful car. It, it, it was just security, really. We were able to go on vacation, let's put it this way, take a vacation, which he hadn't been able to do. Manuel Ibarra's son, John, joined the ILW in 1985 and was a member for many years before Manuel began working on the docks. John was a dispatcher the year Manuel began working. I dispatched his first job. I was a flex dispatcher at night. The day guys let me stay and dispatch his job. And that was 
I think I cried for three days, I don't know. It just felt so good, you know, that he, that, that he dispatched me. I asked him, how was your day today? He goes, you, you wouldn't believe this, but John gave me my first job, my first ticket. I said, really? Wow, that was really, he was really proud, really proud. John and I came in in, in 85, large group of 500 people. Um, myself coming from Long Beach, there wasn't a lot of people that came in with me, so I, I didn't know a lot of people. If you can imagine a guy that's about a foot and a half shorter than me taking me under his wing, <laughs> you know, he just showed me San Pedro, he showed me the ways, and, and uh, I just respected him for that, you know. There was uh, the ships, the banana boats at the time, you, you get down to the hole and you were working shoulder to shoulder with some people, so you quickly were able to establish who was um, working in the right direction and who you needed to probably stay, stay clear of. So John tried to live up to, to the Ibarra standards, you know. We used to work uh, our asses off, really. We worked our asses off on the bananas, and everyone didn't want that job. But it was the only thing keeping money in our pockets, is either lashing, working in a hole, or bananas. They still came in boxes, and you had to hand jive them. Hand jive them, that, they're 40-pound boxes. You had to throw them on these conveyors. Then they go on this crane. And so when you went down there and worked, all the guys we got in, John Mascola and... Joey Radisic, Mike Trudeau, all these guys that were great guys. Um, we had a challenge, and the challenge is that that conveyor belt can't stop. Longshoring can be hard work, but unfortunately for some members, it is also hard living. The union takes great pride in providing a drug and alcohol recovery program for members that need help. One of the early leaders of the program in Southern California was Rudy Alba's father-in-law, Ed Torres. Him being a recovering alcoholic, it played right into, he knew what the individuals were experiencing. So he poured everything into it. You know, I mean, if somebody would call him at night, needed help, he would help them, he would meet them, he would make connections so the individual could, could get uh, some help as they needed it. And uh, just took a lot of pride in, in, in that job. Myself, I have... Uh, a son who's struggling right now, and uh, um, to be able to have somebody to call and get some answers, get pointed in the right direction, uh, it's been amazing. I've seen quite a few guys come out of that program, you know, and come out good and be good and do good. When they finally decided to get their life in order, you know, it was a place where you could go, and when you seen the guys again, they were like reborn again and are clean still to this day, and have lived longer because of it, I see. I don't think they would have probably made it this far if it wasn't for the drug you know, rehab. From giving members a second chance with its drug rehab program, to the good pay and excellent benefits, ILW members have lots of gratitude for the great life the union provides them, and so they consider it very important to help as volunteers. One of the ways members give back is to walk the picket lines. This was especially important in 2002 when the Employers Association locked out dock workers during a contract negotiation. One guy might be a pushover, but not all of us together. You always feel more powerful. So when we would be picketing, it was like we were in charge. You know, belonging to the ILWU was like you were in charge. ILWU had a lot of pool because there was 3,000 guys behind you fighting you know, like an army instead of one person for just what was right. The solidarity was, it was just so, so great and, and everybody on the same page about what we wanted. All we wanted just to be fair. And it was really, really organized. Everybody knew what the heck they were doing. Everybody had a place that they, they went to and we all had our picket cards and we'd check in with the picket captain and, and do our duties. Some of the guys would, would uh, do their four hours or, or their day, and uh, you had a minimum what you had to do. You know, you, you, you had to do a minimum, no excuses. Some guys did way more than that, you know. I decided to be a picket captain. I didn't go home for 11 days. I slept in my truck, you know. Um, people would bring us food. This was a, a real threat to our family, the ILWU family, and then your own family no money and uh, that was serious business to me so I, I, I decided to stay there and my kids and my wife they understood that that ain't coming home I wasn't going home and I didn't go home after 11 days I went home but, but that's what I felt in my heart that I had to do 
The dedication exhibited by John Ibarra and other ILW members likely comes from the family culture that surrounds the ILW, where the spouses and children of members participate in events such as Bloody Thursday picnics and Labor Day marches. From when I was a little kid, my grandfather took me to the uh, Labor Day, you know, parades, walk, jump on our scooters, you know, jump on our scooters, right? I didn't know what it was. I just known that, you know, my grandma, my grandpa was going to go with all his, you know, his buddies and I show up and I see, you know, thousands of people and I'm just like, man, this is all your coworkers? Yeah, yeah, these are all my union brothers. Man, that's so cool, you know? They enjoyed that. They wear their little caps, you know, longshoremen caps. And my little one, my grandson, uh, my husband Manuel would put him in the, in the little red wagon and pull him. And uh, he'd be real proud too, walking behind all the, all the workers. I was probably like maybe four, maybe just turned four. And I remember my dad picking us up for our weekend with him. And he would take us to the picket lines. And we, me and my bro, two older brothers would hold the picket signs and we'd go around in that circle. And we were just so, we just thought it was so fun. And the, the men down there were so nice to us and it was just fun. Angel's father, Joe Ibarra, was a longtime leader of the ILWU. He organized workers on behalf of the union, was elected local 26 president, and later secretary treasurer of the International. My dad was a good talker and he talked to you from his heart. And my dad was the type that if you needed help and he knew you, he was gonna help you. He was gonna try to try to find a way to solve your problem. When he was trying to unionize the office workers, the docs didn't want him in there. Uh, each company didn't want him there, but he was a persistent guy. So he would go try to talk to the, the office workers at lunchtime, you know, tell them all the good things that would happen, you know, if they became union and, and, and I seen him at many docks because I didn't work at just one. So he was persistent and he was very logically spoken. You know, he spoke to you in the regular words and talking to every office worker, every individual one, you know, until it became what it was, till they unionized. He really accomplished a lot. Um, I remember we were out in Seattle at the uh, convention my Uncle Joe was there, and he was with Cesar Chavez, and he introduced me to him. And Cesar Chavez gave me a little pen with, with the wings and a little um, attached to it with a strawberry. I still have it to this day. But um, I was so proud of my uncle. Like, to me, I always looked at him like he was a president of something. Cesar Chavez was the legendary Mexican-American leader of the United Farm Workers Union. Just like Chavez was a pioneer in the Farm Workers Union, Joe Ibarra, along with Rudy Rubio, were the first Mexican-Americans elected to executive board positions at the international level of the ILWU. We, uh, we Mexicans, uh, I think we work hard. We, uh, we try our best and everything. It, uh, they feel bad on uh, a lot of things because I think they put us down. But uh, our work ethics, are great. Angela Barra inherited a strong work ethic from her family roots. This is best exhibited in her journey as a longshore casual. Casuals are entry-level dock workers who are striving toward earning full-time status. I was one of the first 3,000 people in the 2004 um, casual pick. Um, I had no idea what it was going to entail. It was probably most one of the most difficult things I've ever accomplished just because it took so long. About every 10 years, um, we'll put out what's called an interest card. The current members of the ILWU get a card and the general public has an opportunity to send in a card of their own. They get mixed in a barrel and they get drawn sequentially and depending on how many people they need to backfill the casual hall um, is what they'll draw. Um, so if you're lucky enough to be one of those individuals, if you're lucky enough to get drawn, then you're unlucky enough <laughs> to be placed in the casual hall. Most individuals will work anywhere from 10 to 13 years with no guarantees of when and how much work they're gonna get per week, with no benefits, and no opportunity to know exactly when they will eventually get hired. I've had full-time jobs for different companies that I had to turn down just because of my goal to become a longshoreman, full-time longshoreman member. Um, I've had three jobs at a time going 
working day side at the docks, going to my night job, going back to my side job before I go back to the hall, going to the hall, not getting a job, calling off of work to go night side to try to pick up a job, not getting out, leaving all the money on the table just to become, a, get the hours to become a longshoreman. The way to get hired is strictly by hours. So you and I enter on the same date, it's a marathon. It's a, it's a sprint to the end of the line by hours. You miss a day because you have another job, I'm eight hours ahead of you. You miss a day because you have childcare issues, I'm eight hours ahead of you, right? You go on vacation, I'm 40 hours ahead of you. So it's competitive, it's stressful, the sacrifice is great. So we'll, we'll see people that are, that are determined and focused and driven. I already had a full-time job with the state of California when I got picked. If they found out I was working for another employer, I would have got fired. So it wasn't easy at all to me. I used to do Superman change in the bathroom, in work attire, run to work, make up some excuse why I was late. I'd work the nine hours, then have to go back at night, work till three in the morning, sleep an hour, and go back at six. So there'd be 24 hours where I wouldn't get sleep. I also had kids, I had a husband, I had a sick grandmother. So you kind of learn to multifunction, you know, multitask. And it's really up to what your drive is, if you're gonna do it or you're not gonna do it. When I see people get in, I'm, uh, even if I don't know them, I'm like, man, I'm happy for them because everyone's story is different, you know? Everyone's story is different. And all the time that's put down there, all the events that you miss, Stuff you can't never get back, but it's all a sacrifice to become a union member. I have a goal, and I've had a goal for going on 12 years. And for me to sacrifice all that time at the end to receive that letter, it's going to be all worth it. So there was 11 years, took me 11 years to get in. I'm in now, and it was kind of worth it. <laughs> My dad loved this union. Growing up, that's all we saw was ILWU. That's all you heard about was ILWU. You know, my dad passed away in 2011, and I wish he was here to see me get in. Um, but to be actually belong to this union now, I know it would make him proud. As far as I'm concerned, the ILWU, I think it's a, it was more like a, a savior, something that, first of all, gave us great hope and then and give us a great future for our kids. Uh, the union means everything to my family. Um, it provided security for my family, from my great-grandfathers, my grandfather, uncles, cousins. It provided security uh, medically and financially, provided a, a future, a future for all of us, um, especially for me. It just gave me an opportunity to become, you know, an, a future legacy. Um, in my little branch of my family. You know, everything I do is for my family. Just that word chokes me up, family, because that's what we grew up on as family. You know, growing up the way I grew up, we didn't have a lot. The, the thing we had a lot of was love. We had a big family, uncles and aunts, and everyone loves each other. That's the thing. Everyone loves each other, and they care for each other. And that's what I, the Ibarra, like the Ibarra, that's what we're made of. That blood, that family, that's what we're about. And, and that didn't work. So the ILWU has to go along with our family on both sides. It just, it has to, it's just a part of our lives. Mm -hmm.